talking with Steve Simpson from UGRS.net. Is that right? That's it, Nina. Yeah. So as in UGRs. I've known you for, for many years, actually. In fact, I've been very intrigued by your specific focus in, uh, well, can I say what it is, UGRs? Are you going to tell Absolutely. us what UGRs are? Is that the first best question? <laughs> yes. Um, well, that's a good place to start, Nina, because um, UG, I, I created the concept of UGRs, which stands for Unwritten Ground Rules, um, uh, to help people understand and improve their culture because there's a lot written about culture and it's talked about a lot uh, in the recent like couple of decades. But I think there's a lack of clarity about what it actually means and what we can do about it. So it was partly for that reason that I created the UGRs concept. So UGRs, Unwritten Grand Rules, people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. And they can include things like at our meetings, it isn't worth complaining because we know nothing will get done. Uh, the only time anyone gets spoken to by the boss is when something is wrong and so on. So these drive people's behaviour, yet remarkably, they are seldom if ever talked about openly. It's the UGRs, the Unwritten Grand Rules, that constitute a team or organisation's culture. I think it's, as, it's that simple to understand, Nina. So UGR, Unwritten Ground Rules, is really the norms, the unspoken or the invisible norms that that's how we uh, operate around here. And then if new people come in, there's no, there's no procedure manual for the UGRs, for the unwritten ground rules. It's like they make an error and they go, oh, 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 oh okay, I'll remember that for next time. So why should organisations focus on culture anyway? Well, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, we did some research a while back and to be honest with you, Nina, we stumbled across this question. I now ask this question whenever I get in front of a team of leaders or have a Zoom meeting with a team of leaders. And I share the research that we did. We asked this question, if the culture of your workplace was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be on people's performance slash productivity? So in our research, we gave people a sliding scale, started at zero because zero is a legitimate answer. You might think the culture now realistically is as good as it's going to get. And then we gave people a sliding scale, 10 percent, 20 percent, up to 100 and then 100 percent plus. In our research, Nina, 89 percent of senior leaders, that's nine out of 10 senior leaders, said 20 percent or more improvement would occur. 58 percent, so that's six out of 10 middle managers, said 50% or more improvement would occur. When I do this face-to-face -face or via Zoom, uh, it normally averages at around 40%. So I say to people, where else would you get performance improvement of that magnitude? So in essence, Nina, I think this is the business case for culture. And I think many leaders, while understanding the culture is important, might not have connected those dots to actually pinpoint the incredible benefits that can occur, the business case for culture, which I think is vitally important. Well, why is it that, that managers and leaders seem to just accept the status quo? Why don't they do more to enhance culture if improving culture is going to have such a big result? Yeah, and again, that's a really good question. Um, and I haven't given you these questions, Nina, it's, but they're impressive questions. Um, <laughs> Look, I, I think it relates to the complexity of culture. And, you know, I think, like, as I said before, I think over the last 20 or so years, there's been an, a, an incredible exponential increase in the extent towards, to which the word culture is used. It's so commonly used, even in sporting contexts now, it's got broader application than workplaces. But I think the paradox is that while it's used a lot, few people understand culture in simple and practical terms. What you don't understand, you don't manage. What you don't manage, you become a victim of. And I think many leaders intuitively know that their culture might not be as good as it can be, but feel a bit perplexed about what is it that I can do to make a fundamental improvement in the culture. And to be honest, I think that's where UGRs has a part to play because it's a very simple concept. It resonates, everyone gets it. And it makes culture, I think, more tangible because to change the culture, we've got to change the UGRs. It's as simple to understand as that. 
And your book title says it all, A Culture Turned. So I guess people working with you, you go in and help them turn the ship around <laughs> and improve their culture. And possibly, maybe uh, you probably start with some uh, process that actually identifies what's happening under the surface that people just turn a blind eye to or have a blind spot to. Would that be right? 100%. Um... What we do, we've got a five-step process and we won't have time to talk through the five steps today, but I can talk to the first two. The first step of our five-step process is a step we call envision. And that says forget UGRs for the time being because there's a vital question that we think every leadership team needs to ask and it's this. What are the key cultural attributes we need in place for us to be truly successful while making this a great place to work? So put more simply, the question is this. What does our culture need to look and feel like for us to truly be successful while making this a great place to work? Now, it's possible that many people who are viewing this have values statements in their organisation. And if they're strong and people are fighting for those values, that in the values actually answer that question. So it can be treated as a separate exercise or we might just affirm our values as being our aspirational culture that we need to have in place. But once they're agreed, and we'd recommend no more than five, um, once they're agreed, and again, this might just be affirming the values, we can then find out what the current UGRs are in relation to those values or cultural attributes. So I'll give you one example. Um, if we have a value of teamwork, we can get people anonymously to complete the sentence to what we call a lead in sentence. So for teamwork, we could get people anonymously to complete their sentence around here when you need help, or around here when it comes to dealing with people from other work areas. So that provides gobsmacking information about some of the UGRs linked that, to that key aspect of our culture that we're fighting for, which is teamwork. And um, we, that, that's what we call a UGR stock rate take, where we craft lead in sentences linked to our aspirational culture. And it's a gobsmacking exercise to see the outcomes from that, Nina. That's that's a very interesting process, Steve. And I'm thinking back to, uh, it was around the year 2000 where every single company had to have a vision mission statement. And I don't know what percentage of companies have not revised it since then, and that's 21 years ago. <laughs> So do you Absolutely. think um, there's a bit of a mismatch between what the value statements are and what people really feel are the uh, aspirational values and also even what, what, the, what the, the, the gap is between aspiration and reality? Well, 100%, and you're nailing it. And I mean, the, the, the first question to ask, to tap into your point, Nina, is, so what are your values? And oftentimes people have to go to the documentation. So that says something in itself. Um, so we need to have clarity and commitment to our aspirational cultures. And if the values are talking to that, that's what we need to have clarity and commitment to. But then, you know, it's, it's, it, it is quite remarkable, the UGRs that we're able to surface. So for example, we, we've come across many organisations that have a value of, for example, constant improvement. So to gain access to the UGRs associated with that, we'll craft a lead in sentence like, around here when someone comes up with a new idea. And Nina, it's not uncommon when we've done that particular lead in sentence to get people responding with words like this, around here when someone comes up with a new idea, bosses pinch the good ones and use them as their own. Oh. Now that's, you know, it, it, that's remarkable when you think about the consequences for that UGR, because if I'm in a meeting and that's my UGR and the boss or somebody else says any, any ideas on how we can, we can improve this, if that's my UGR and I've got an idea, I'm going to say nothing because that, that, is, that UGR is driving my behaviour. So it's, it is quite amazing to reveal these UGRs and to get people to ponder the consequences of them because invariably the prevailing UGRs held by often a significant proportion of people have really damaging impact on the performance of individuals and teams collectively. It's, it's amazing stuff. So it seems to me that we could even call pinching ideas from people that, uh, that uh, are your individual contributors that directly report to you. That's a form of emotional abuse, wouldn't you say? 
Well, it's interesting you raise that again because only a couple of weeks ago I did my first face-to-face -face conference in uh, more than 12 months and it was, um, it was on uh, wellness, health and wellness. And the, the whole notion of psychological safety was raised. And, you know, I'm not an expert in that arena, but I talked about the application of UGRs in that context. And I think um, that UGRs, you know, I could almost reframe the whole UGRs body of, of knowledge to, to link to the health and wellness domain because the whole issue of psychological, psychological safety I think is directly connected to UGRs. And for that matter, I think it's relatively unexplored in that domain. You know, I, I, I've had a hunch, and again, I'm not claiming to be an expert in this area. I've had a hunch for a long time that a major source of workplace stress relates to uh, a context where my personal values are different from the UGRs that I feel compelled to conform to in the workplace. And I think that's really unexplored in the whole domain. What I'm, what I'm thinking about is that, in a sense, psychological safety, as defined by Amy Edmondson, and Amy Cuddy also uh, furthered the, uh, the definition, is that people have the ability to speak uh, you know, openly and not feel bullied, um, disapproved, judged, or, uh, or, or, or penalised in any way, but it seems to me that their idea, another aspect, add addition to that definition is, and their ideas won't be stolen and credit denied because people need to be acknowledged when they give a good idea and actually be celebrated and applauded. And that's what actually cultivates a better team culture. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, when, when we work through this with, with uh, leaders and with teams, our argument is that um, when people proffer an idea, they don't, most of them don't have a, a, the false or unrealistic expectation that their idea, every one of their ideas will be implemented. <laughs> but people have a desire to find out um, how their idea has progressed and if it's been rejected, why? And I think um, if that happens, mo the vast majority of people are very reasonable and are accepting of that and will continue to proffer their ideas in, in the future, you know? So it's not difficult, it's just o too often overlooked, I think, Nina. I think that's probably the issue. Well, Steve, there's already to, uh, tools available. I'm thinking of the Kaizen board and if it's operated properly, a Kaizen board, you've heard of it, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Is yes. the idea that you uh, have a small enthusiastic Kaizen committee who monitor the board and maybe every two weeks uh, take off fresh ideas, but people, people can post a fresh idea, whether it be a physical board or a digital one, post a fresh idea and they actually get see it progressing. Either it's accepted and will be implemented or it will be uh, you know, say, no, we're not going to do it. And given the reason, but the person offering the idea is acknowledged all the way through. And that almost gives an arm's length uh, tool to ideas being shared because something, there must be some character flaw inside leaders who feel they, they don't have enough creative ideas of their own, that they have to steal the ideas from the people that uh, work with them. What do you think? Well, there's that, and I think your idea about the Kaizen board is a really good one, and we need to have those systems and processes in place. But there's another dimension as well, and that is, what's the appetite for feedback? What's the appetite for collecting new ideas that each of the individual leaders have? And again, I don't think this, um, I don't think this starts with deliberate acts. I think it's more oversight. And, and lack of insight that many leaders have. And once they become, a, look, once people become aware of UGRs, often it's a revelation for them because once you tune into the UGRs, you are forced to do some self-reflection and that really can't hurt anyone. So there's benefits in that respect, I think. Because mm. because the trend now is definitely towards the high EQ leader, you know, the high emotional intelligence. And this is all part of raising emotional intelligence. Is, do you sort of refer to EQ or emotional intelligence when you're working with leaders and their teams? We don't, but but I, I'm, I'm sure you're right. Um, mm. I think it really adds significantly to the EQ. Look, we've worked, for example, in the automotive industry with a, with a um, couple of major brands that um, most of you people are viewing this would know. Um, 
And I, I can remember very clearly presenting to a group of leaders in a region in Australia. And at the end of the session, which was, I think, from memory, a half a day session, one of the senior leaders stood up uh, to wrap up the session. And he paused for quite some time before saying anything. And he said, do you know what? In this industry, all we ever talk about is numbers, numbers, and numbers. He said, this is the first time we've ever stopped to reflect on something other than numbers. And again, I, I don't think that's, that's not by design, it's just sort of happened that way. So by focusing on culture and the, the huge potential for performance improvement, I think that process has also elevated the EQ. So I think you're right. Mm. In fact, um, an earlier uh, episode of uh, in this podcast is with Michael McQueen about connecting uh, profitability with a, uh, un, stating your purpose and and making your purpose quite uh, conscious. So it seems to me that uh, UGRs is along the same uh, a continuum where if you focus on culture and what is not serving uh, behavior that's not serving the team that profitability is going to come. The figures will, pr <laughs> will will be better as a result. Is that is that been your experience where you've followed, worked with a team and then maybe observed their results later? Oh, um, absolutely, Nina. And uh, my best example of that is Kmart in Australia and New Zealand because um, I work with Kmart over an eight-year period. Many people will not be aware that um, Kmart had literally lost money for 10 years years in a row, literally. West Farmers purchased it, put in, in place a new leader, Guy Russo, the best leader I've ever met. He loved UGRs and um, came out at the time, had a toxic culture, and I'm choosing that word deliberately, it was toxic. Stores would ring into head office, as it was then called, it's now called support office, words matter. Um, stores would ring into head office and they would, the phones would ring out. People would walk past ringing telephones. There was internal warfare within Kmart. Now, Guy Russo used, and the team, the leadership team used UTRs as the vehicle to understand and improve culture across Kmart. And we can't claim that UGRs is responsible for the massive transition of Kmart, but it was one of four change platforms. And um, many people will now know that Kmart is regarded as Australia's leading retailer. Pre-COVID, it was making half a billion dollars in profit by Australian standards, that's massive. Um, and its culture is magnificent to the point where it's so good, staff are so proud to say I work for Kmart, that they protect it. They, are, they become the, the beacons of the culture and you know, want to sustain it into the future. So look, not only um, does it make life at work a whole lot better, you get joy out of coming into work and being part of a productive, positive, dynamic team. But there's uh, profitable outcomes as well. It's it's a win-win for everyone. Um, just before we go, and uh, I'll be steering people again to your talking a little bit about your book, A Culture Turned. Um, can you give me what's the managers that are listening to this podcast today or aspiring managers, What's one aspect of cultural behaviour that they could look for to see that they may not be aware of that you find is quite common, that there's a common pattern in this? Okay, look, um, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'm going to tell you a story. It literally happened to me, and I'll name the organisation because it happened a long time ago. I was working with a company called Next in the UK. Now, many people will know that Next is a massive, used to be bricks and mortar retailer, but now massive online as well. Um, they've got 600 people in their IT division. That's how big they are. And I was working with the IT division. We were doing UGRs. At the end of our session, I had a debriefing uh, session with the leaders. And I asked the leaders this question. I think this is a, such a vitally important question. I asked them this question. I said, if I was talking to the people who report to you, so you're not in the room, but I'm talking to your people, and I asked them this question, how would they answer it? What are your leaders' top three priorities? So just to repeat, you're not in the room leaders, but I'm asking your people that question. There was a long pause, Nina, and the first guy to speak up, to his credit, said this. He said, Steve, we don't even know what our top three priorities are, so how would they? So what's my point? 
Um, we need as leaders to make a decision. Is culture a top three priority or not? You don't go to jail if it's not a top three priority, but we need to have a serious conversation around that. Because if it is, then the next question is, so what can we do as a leadership team to demonstrate to people that culture is a top three priority? And in fact, with the leadership team at Next, we whiteboarded a series of questions that they could ask their people that would demonstrate that culture is a top three priority. Because apart from tuning into the UGRs that you might be able to tune in to now being more aware of UGRs, I think the fundamental thing is for the leadership team to consider what are our top three priorities. It's vitally important to consider that question. Now, your book is called A Culture Turned. Did you write that with your collaborative partner in South Africa, Steph Duplessis? Or is that? Yes. Yes, you did? Tell yes, Steph's a great what? man, a great really? man based I've in Johannesburg. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's based in Johannesburg. And um, yeah, so we work together on big projects. So, for example, at McLaren Automotive in the UK, we work together. But um, for smaller projects, we work independently. Um, yeah. And, uh, and the book... Uh, it's on Amazon. Uh, what what would uh, people get by reading the book? So I like to encourage people to read after they've been listening to our our episode, Steve. <laughs> Nina, it's a fictional story of culture transformation, but it's not fictional. It's actually the sum total of real experiences that we've had. So every example that we use in this fictional uh, company transformation is real. Um, the, I'll give you one example. Um, in the, in, in the book, it tells the story of a boss speaking to all of his people. This was a true story, but it's fictional in the, in the, in the book. Uh, talking to all of his people, pointing to one young guy in the audience in front of everyone and saying, be careful, young man, be careful. Now, that actually happened. But, of course, it's woven in to our fictional story. And we talk about, uh, and the book considers the uh, implications UGRs-wise of that particular incident. So, well, yeah. I'll tell you what, that's going to attract a lot of people to get the book because books that do use the uh, fictional story, I'm thinking of uh, Eli Goldratt's The Gold, uh, The Goal. That's a fictional story and there's others like that. There's even uh, Cotter's Our Iceberg is Melting about change. Yes. So yes. fictional stories are great. They're easy to get the concept and you can then, uh, you know, reflect upon it. Steve, it's absolutely wonderful speaking with you. And I, I believe you do really important work. You really do. So congratulations. Thank you. That's kind of you. Thank you. And they can find you at UGRS.net. The information will be in the show notes. And um, so uh, you work virtually in all time zones, do you? Well, that's the one upside to COVID, isn't it, Nina? Because geography is less relevant now. So, yeah, we're yeah. working with uh, all time zones. Face to face in Australia now is an option, right. which is really exciting, but also right. via Zoom. That's right. Well, thanks for, for being available today for me to uh, have a conversation with you. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Nina. It's been great to connect with you.